and uh, got a little bit of a cold, and so uh, I've had one for six weeks now. <laughs> but but it's going to get over with. But it's it's so good to be here. And if you're going to be tuning in to uh, a website, we especially welcome you. This is uh, Grace Community Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Beautiful place. The winter is almost over, I thought. <laughs> but then I turned the TV on, and we're supposed to have some more snow. So, uh, But uh, it's still a lovely place. Come and visit us. Drop in our church. And uh, if you don't like the first pastor, the next one that preaches the next week, you may like him. So anyway... <laughs> We've got, uh, we're going to be talking today about three very important questions. Three very important questions. And uh, these questions are ha uh, literally hounds mankind from the very beginning of time. And these three questions are, how did I get here? Where did I come from? And where am I going? Now that one didn't come up. There it, there it is. Where am I going? Now, every one of us have been faced with these questions at one time or another. And there are two sources of knowledge in which we can gain information concerning these questions. How did I get here? Where did I come from? And where am I going? And they stand in opposition to one another. You have, first of all, the Word of God. The foundation is the Bible itself. As the Bible says, God created the heaven and the earth, and he did it in six days. Now, that's a question that a lot of people will argue about, but I believe that what the Bible says. And uh, the Word of God provides the answer to man's most basic questions that we ask. How did I get here? Where did I come from? And where am I going? First of all, you have the Word of God, and then you have, secondly, as a source of knowledge, the Word of man. Now, what is the foundation of the Word of man? It certainly isn't the, the Bible, but the Word of man has its foundation in what, what they call evolution. We are the byproduct they say, of evolution. Now, how many of you heard about evolution in school at one time or another? Almost all, almost all of you, if you haven't, you're going to hear it. You're still in school. It's taught in the elementary classes. It's taught in, in uh, middle school. It's taught in high school. It's taught in the colleges and universities. You can't get away from it. We see it in te on television. Evolution. And uh, they feel that this is the key or, or the source of knowledge for these three questions. The answer to these three questions depends upon the foundation that you're drawing your conclusions from. Are you drawing it from the foundation, which is the Word of God, are you drawing it from the foundation, which is evolution, presented by man? Have you ever heard someone say, well, I don't believe in God or the Bible because it's, it's unscientific. Science proves evolution, not creation. Is that a true statement? Absolutely not. Evolution is based upon theory. 
You've heard of the theory of evolution, haven't you? But have you ever heard of the theory of the Bible? No, it's not there, you know. It's the theory of evolution. It's man's thoughts on a subject. And uh, they say that science proves evolution, not creation. Evolution is based upon theory. The theory is based upon the belief that there is no God. And if there is no God, then there, there, there has to be another reason for our existence. And so they created Darwin and others who rejects the idea of a personal God, who created all things, came up with a theory of evolution. And over a period of millions and or billions and billions of years, man evolved from the amoeba. And they progressed upward over time. Then he began as an amoeba in the swamps. And he's progressing forward ever since. He's moving towards perfection. The whole evolutionary process is the foundation that is built upon the word of man. Not the word of God. But the foundation that is built upon the word of God declares that man was created perfect in the Garden of Eden. Perfect. But he is slowly progressing downward to the amoeba in the swamps. He is digressing rather than progressing. Evolutionists ask the question, can we prove that God is a creator of all things? How about it? Can Christians prove that God is the creator of all things? If so, how? Well, first of all, through visible evidences. Now, you can't prove it by personal observation because none of us was there when it was originally created. I don't think any of us was there. Anybody here that was there when God created us? No. They weren't there when it happened. Psalm says, The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech, and night unto night showeth the knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voices is not heard. That's Psalm 19, 1 through 3. God has made himself known not only in the universe, but also in all of nature itself. Through the universe, and through nature, we become conscious of the where and aware of the fact of God and his existence. All around us, there's a witness. The voice of God is speaking to us and telling us of the fact of God. How can anyone claim to be intelligent and a sincere seeker of the Word of God, or a sincere seeker of the truth, and completely ignore the fact of God. How can anyone claim to be a scientist or intelligent and ignore all of creation going on around him? I don't know about you, but I love to go out on a clear night and look up into the stars. 
And you say, oh God, you're such a magnificent God. How did you create all of this? Well, the evolutionists would never think of doing that. They try to have a scientific term. Everything in existence today, folks, has a, has a fingerprint of God upon it. Everything. The universe, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, man himself is, uh, it testifies to the fact that there is a divine designer has the fingerprints of God. You know when a, a, a crime is committed, they go in and they try to uh, uh, secure evidence. And one of the things that they uh, secure is fingerprints. And by fingerprints, they can tell who did it. And the thing is, that same thing is true with God. We ought to be able to look at, uh, at the universe around us, at the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and man himself, that are and see the fingerprints of God upon it. One example of the human body that I think is really fascinating is the human eye. Now I gave this a blue eye because I've got blue eyes. <laughs> But the human eye is really fascinating. The different facets of the human eye testifies to the fact that it could not come about by mere chance, but rather from a master designer. The muscles that controls the movement of the eye. The method by which pictures are taken at 18 impulses per second and impressed upon this jelly substance uh, vibrating the message into the brain so that uh, I get the message and the color and the distinguishing you would have to be totally amazed at the intricacy and the complexity of the human eye that is also true of the rest of the human body, as well as the whole universe. The universe itself declares loudly that there must have been a designer to make me. There has to be. Because you, when you see something that requires a tremendous design, you know that there has to be a designer for that. One would have to be completely ignorant or insane to say that all of this came about over billions and billions and billions of years by mere chance through the process of evolution. Totally ignoring all the evidence of a designer. Let me ask you something. Which takes more faith? To believe that billions and billions of years ago there was, what? Well, nothing. Nothing. And out of this nothing came uh, this huge glob of particles. It was pushed together. And then you had this big bang and everything went out into the universe. The third little planet from the sun called Earth was nothing but uh, just boiling rocks. And the rain beat upon these rocks and beat upon it. And they became mush. And out of this mush climbed a, an amoeba. And uh, from there you have 
Darwin's evolutionary chart. Working its way all the way up to uh, mankind. Now to me, that would take a lot of faith to believe that, wouldn't it? How about you? I, I have a hard time believing that my great, 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 great grandpa was a monkey sw swinging in a tree. How about you? The Bible says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, I wouldn't dare call them a fool, but the Bible does. And they're sure playing the part of a fool, aren't they? Now, don't try to tell me that evolution doesn't uh, make a whole lot more, doesn't take a whole lot more faith to believe than to simply believe that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Once you come to accept the fact that there is a God and he created you, then there is another question that we must face. And that is, if God created you, then what does he require of me now? If God really did create me, if I didn't really just evolve over millions and billions of years to what I am, if God created me, then what does he require of me. God has two plans I want to show you. Two plans for mankind. And we can call these plans plan A and plan B. Now under plan A we find God requires this of, of you. That you be perfect he requires perfection of you under plan A. God is holy, you see, and his holiness demands absolute purity to be in his presence. Apart from holiness, no man, the Bible says, can see God. And this becomes very real to Israel through their uh, through their sacrifices, especially through the preparation of the high priest, who every, once every year would purify himself. He would wash himself and make sure that he was purified. He would offer a sacrifice for himself because he was representing the entire nation of Israel. And he knew that if he went in there without being cleansed perfectly, then he would die. Are you familiar with the garb of the high priest? I don't want to go into all the detail, but at the very bottom of their, whatever you call it, garment, there was a little bell attached. And every time he stepped, they would, they would sound out. And another thing that was attached to their, their legs was a rope. And when they went, went into the Holy of Holies there to represent the children of Israel, if the high priest still had some unconfessed sin in his life or something, and he killed over dead, they would have a way of pulling him out. Because no one could go in there and get him out, or that they would die. So this rope enabled them to pull out the unconfessed high priest. 
Now this shows something about what God has expected of the children of Israel. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 13, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. And even Jesus said in the New Testament the same thing. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now what does it mean to be perfect? Well, it means to absolutely hit the mark. It's an archery term. It's to be exactly what God wants you to be. And we read, when we read in Scripture that God requires us to be perfect with the, with the Lord our God, we immediately realize that we have missed the mark. We're not perfect. Standing in the consciousness of the ideal person. And who is the ideal person? Jesus himself. Standing in the consciousness of, of Jesus Christ, we are aware of the fact that we are sinners. We've missed the mark. If you want to know why God created you, you must look at Jesus Christ. For in him we find God's ideal man fulfilled. And as we look at God's ideal man, we find what God intended when he made man and placed him upon the earth. And also, as we look at this ideal man, we realize that we've missed the mark. We're sinners. We failed in fulfilling the purpose of God for us. Now, is there any hope for us, for mankind, now that we've failed miserably? Is there any hope for us? And this leads us to the last question that you need to find an answer to. Now that I recognize that I'm a sinner, that I've failed to measure up to God's holy standard, what does God require of me now? And that's where plan B comes in at. Up to this point, there's been nothing but bad news. Under plan A, that's all that there is, is bad news. We really need some good news here, folks. So, so far, we've had only bad news. We don't measure up to the standard of God. We're sinners. We've missed the mark. We've all come short of the glory of God. But there is good news. Plan A carries with it good news. Now this good news first began back in the Gospels. But the good news there, having to do with Israel, was that you must accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and the kingdom will come. But that's not the good news that I'm talking about here. What does God require of us today in this dispensation? The good news for failing, rebellious man who has missed the mark. What does God require of me? Just this. Listen. Listen. Believe on the believe the good news. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you 
the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Then you recall what Paul and Silas, when they were thrown into the prison, and they began to pray, what happened? There was a tremendous earthquake, and that literally shook the prison. It opened the prison gates where the prisoners could walk right out. The prison guards, thinking that the prisoners was going to escape, he drew his sword. He was going to kill himself. Because you see, for a, a guard, a Roman guard, who was uh, charged with keeping the inmates in prison, for them to escape meant what? It meant torture, unimaginable torture, the end death. So he thought it was better if he killed himself. And then it says in Acts 16, then he called for a light. Paul and Silas said, don't hurt yourself. Don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You see, he didn't say, Well, you've got to clean up your life and live a perfect life and, and keep the commandments and, and all this stuff. He said, That's under plan A. But he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's simple enough, isn't it? God required perfection under plan A. They missed it. What does God now require of us, the imperfect creatures that we are? He requires we just believe on his provision of love in Jesus Christ. And that we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's all. This is the work of God, it says. That you believe on him whom he has sent. Folks, it's so easy that anyone can do it. Anyone. You say, well, you mean I can do it right now? Right where I'm sitting? You bet you can. Absolutely. When you believe in Jesus Christ, accepting him as your personal Savior, realizing that he took your sins upon himself, as, uh, and then you cry out, Oh, Jesus, I believe and accept and take you now as my Lord and Savior. Then what happens? Jesus Christ comes into your life with power, a new dynamic, a new force, and this new power begins to change you. He gives you a new nature, and he helps you do those things that are pleasing unto him. You see, God hasn't given up on his perfect creature idea. Except he's taken over. He's fashioning it and creating it in your life himself. 
And you're going to be presented faultless, the Bible <coughs> says, before the throne of God. So I know that most of you, if not all of you, are Christians here. Even most of you young people. But if you're not, then you don't have to come forward to accept the Lord. Maybe you've seen that and you're scared of that. And you don't want to do that, you know. You don't have to. Right where you're at, you can say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I just want to accept you and what you did for me on the cross. Come into my life and save me. That's it. That's all you have to do. So simple. That's plan B. Isn't it a wonderful plan? Father God, we pray that you might just be with us in a very special way. Help us, Lord, to honor and glorify you in everything that we do and say. We know, Lord, that we are imperfect creatures. But in spite of that fact, <clears throat> you loved us and you gave your son to die for us. And you made it so easy that we can just receive you into our heart and life. Just believe the gospel. And Father, I pray that we'll do that. If there's one here that has never done that, I pray that they'll open up their heart and life to you this morning and, and accept you as their Lord and Savior. For we ask it in Jesus' name. For his sake we do pray. Amen. <laughs>